The following is taken from my commentary on Philemon, 2 John, 3 John, and Jude on fire. Meet Diotrephes. If you've attended several churches over your lifetime, then most likely you've already met him. In fact, you may have encountered him in every church you frequented. Would you know if you came upon him? Surprisingly, he's not necessarily an iron-fisted ogre who overtly rules in the church. Diotrephes can come in various shapes and sizes. Often he is not the pastor of the congregation, at least officially. He tends to be a person who has attended the same church for many years. Moreover, he strives to wear humility on his sleeve. But don't worry if you don't initially see it, because in a subtle way he will either tell you about it or aggressively display his contrite spirit. Indeed, he will further explain to you that he doesn't want to be the church's pastor. Yet, for some strange coincidence, pastors come and go, and Diotrephes remains. Diotrephes believes he is omniscient when it comes to his church. When the pastor or pastoral staff give direction for the church, he can humbly tell you why it's not God's will and then can privately inform you about the mind of the Lord. That's uh, Diotrephes, but before we study him in uh, detail in Second, or excuse me, Third John, uh, I'd like uh, to ask you just two questions. Number one, how should you respond to church leaders who are shepherding your soul? How should you respond to those who are governing you in the Lord? And number two, what is your obligation to those who don't submit? to church leaders. I want you to think about that. Uh, I'll begin reading here a third John beginning in verse 9. I wrote to the church, but Diotrephes, who loves to have the preeminence among you, does not receive us. Therefore, if I come, I will call to mind his deeds, which he does, pratting against us with malicious words and not content with that. He himself does not receive the brethren and forbids those who wish to, putting them out of the church. Beloved, do not imitate what is evil, but what is good. He who does good is of God, but he who does evil has not seen God. Demetrius has a good testimony from all and from the truth itself, and we also bear witness, and you know that our testimony is true. I had many things to write, but I do not wish to write to you with pen and ink, but I hope to see you shortly, and we shall speak face to face. Peace to you. Our friends greet you. Greet the friends by name. Would you join me in prayer this morning? Father, I thank you. It's been a, a real blessing uh, trekking through 1 John, 2 John, and now here we are closing out 3 John. And Lord, the reality is we have those in churches across the country and around the globe that individuals set themselves up as the authority and even are contrary to the pastor or pastoral staff. So help us to understand how we need to respond in certain settings as this. Bless our time together, I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. I wrote to the church. Uh, the verb I wrote is in the past tense, but this is not an epistolary aorist. Uh, that is when a past tense verb is used, which views the letter as already in the recipient's hands. This seems to be that John had written an earlier letter to the church. It either got lost or Diotrephes suppressed it. Uh, it could also be that John had sent a letter uh, via a missionary to introduce that missionary to the congregation. And he says, I wrote to the church, but Diotrephes, who loves to have the preeminence among them, does not receive us. Uh, earlier we learned about Gaius in his life, but he doesn't seem to attend the same congregation as Diotrephes. And I'll give you two reasons here. Uh, notice the wording here, but Diotrephes, who loves to have the preeminence among them. It doesn't say among 
us. It doesn't seem that they're in the same place. And then also, if it were the same church, which I believe it was not, why would John have to inform uh, Gaius about Diotrephes? He would already know about it if they attended the same church congregation. Moreover, uh, what is being dealt with here in 3 John is not doctrinal per se. Uh, recall with me uh, back in 1 John uh, chapter 1 verse 6, 1, 8, and 1, 10, the words, if we say. Uh, three times John there exposed the bad doctrine or teaching of the false teachers, and he did the same three times in 1 John chapter 2. Back in verse 4, verse uh, 6, and verse 9, by the words, he who says. This seems to be a different setting here. It's not theological per se. Uh, perhaps uh, Diotrephes was just a spoiled brat. Think about this for a moment. It is interesting that the rarely used name means nourished by Zeus. Uh, was he a member of the aristocracy? In other words, did he grow up rich and he was just used to being spoiled? And then you have John the Apostle. And I'm sure Diotrephes wasn't the only one that was jealous of the authority of the Apostle. But the key here is not so much theological that Diotrephes is spreading false doctrine. It's more of an authority issue. And what do we learn about Diotrephes who loves to have the preeminence. Uh, one lexicon says this word, which only appears here, by the way, uh, from the Greek New Testament, means to wish to be number one. Uh, Diotrephes desires to be numero uno. And John continues, and he does not receive us. It's not just the Greek verb dekomai to receive here, but it has the prefix. The preposition is affixed to it here, epi, which gives it a strong sense that Diotrephes will not take in John or the missionaries that have been sent. In other words, he shuns John's apostolic authority. Now with that, Having been stated, let me give you the first point. Yield to the direction of church leaders. This is such an important theological topic. Here, yield to the direction of church leaders. And in this case, it would be the Apostle John. And come over with me to 1 Peter chapter 5. We've uh, touched on this passage on several occasions. And Peter is uh, writing here uh, to fellow pastors. And that's what we have in 1 Peter 5, 1. And then the command to them is to shepherd the flock, that they need to be examples uh, to the flock. And then there's a transition made. Notice in 1 Peter 5, 5. Likewise, you younger people submit, that's the command, arrange yourself under the elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. And here's the reason why. And, and to quote, for God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. And now in verse 6, therefore, Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, and you do this by being under the hand of your church authorities, at least those that are walking with God, right? Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. Biblically speaking, all authority is from God. And when we have pastor or pastors in a congregation, we are obligated to be under their leadership. John is an apostle. He's been given vast domain over the churches. And it was the congregations, uh, various congregations, who needed to submit to his apostolic authority. So we need to yield to the direction of church leaders. And now as you're coming back with me to 3 John, let me share point number two. And this gets into the topic here of diatrophies. Confront those who don't yield to church leaders. Confront those who do not yield to church leaders. Uh, John writes here, if I come, if I come. If here is a 
third class condition. You've heard me talk about the first class, something that's assumed to be true. Uh, you have been with me when I've also referred to the second class, assuming something is not true. This is a third class condition, uh, which is the probable future. That is, John most likely will be making a trip and dealing with this individual diatrophies and a church setting. If I come, I will call to mind. See, he's going to remember all these things is what John is saying and his deeds which he has done, what he has done. And there are three deeds in particular that John exposes here. Number one, pratting against us with malicious words. Uh, pratting here is a present tense verb. It only occurs here in the New Testament that is the verb and it, it's a continual pratting. To give you uh, maybe some idea of what the word pratting means, the adjective occurs in 1 Timothy 5.13 and is translated gossip. So think about this. Gossiping against us see continually with malicious words and not content with that. It wasn't enough that Diotrephes just railed against John and his apostolic authority. Uh, he was not satisfied with that. He was not content for that alone. And number two, he himself does not receive the brethren. Now, I want you to step back and consider this. Here is John as an apostle. He was an individual that walked with the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, the only all-night prayer meeting is given to us in the New Testament when Jesus chose the 12 apostles. One of those apostles is the apostle John. John has the authority of Christ. And yet here he is and he's dispatching certain brethren, perhaps missionaries, over to the church where Diotrephes is at. And he doesn't receive the brethren. Now notice the word receive. Now this is the second time we see not only the verb decomai to welcome, but now also for the second time the preposition is affixed to us. And it's very strong here. The concept is that Diotrephes in no way welcomes the brethren. And I just find this intriguing that when you look up the combination of the preposition and the verb affix only occurs twice in the entire Greek New Testament, both times. It pertains to Diotrephes. So we understand very emphatically he doesn't receive the brethren. See, he's in control. And he's not going to let anyone tell him what to do with his church. And now the third thing Diotrephes does. And forbids those who wish to, putting them out of the church. So the members in Diotrephes' church who want to receive John's emissaries, his missionaries, what happens there? Diotrephes exerts his force and even puts those individuals who would receive them out of the church. The word here forbids, it, it's the idea of to cut off or to make weak. Uh, an illustration of this to show you the force of the term over in John chapter 2 and verse 15. Do you recall when the money changers took over the temple and they had an exorbitant price they were putting on their goods? You know, think about all the travelers worldwide. They wouldn't come with what the supplies they needed for, say, for instance, Pentecost. And here they were making a fortune on that. Well, in John chapter 2 and verse 15, it says there that Jesus put them out. He did it rather forcefully, I'm sure. And sadly, this is what Diotrephes is doing to those in his church that would receive the ambassadors that John has sent. Now, moving on, uh, there was a man who had lost his job. So he went to the monks of the monastery to see if they had work for him. They felt really bad for this man, and they came up with a job. They dispatched him up into the tower that on the hour he would ring the bell the number of times for the hour. On one particular day, uh, it was 1 p.m., and as usual, the faithful man went up to the tower 
and he went to ring the bell just once. Well, in the process, the poor fella lost his footing. His face hit the bell. It did ring once, but then he fell to his death. The authorities came around and they wanted to question certain of the monks to say, did you know this man? And one monk looked at the officer and said, no, I don't know his name, but his face sure rings a bell. <laughs> All right, maybe what we're about to see in verse 11 rings a bell to you. Uh, the word imitation, does that sound familiar to you? It should if you're familiar with the letter of 1 Corinthians. In 1 Corinthians 4.16, Paul wrote to those brethren and said, therefore I urge you, imitate me. And then later on in the same book in chapter 11, in verse 1, he says again, imitate me just as I imitate Christ. Imitation is such an important concept. But here's the question. What happens when we imitate what is good? And with that, let me share point number three. Mimic the good and display your relationship with God. Mimic the good and display your relationship with God. God. Now in verse 11, our word beloved, this is the fourth time, the fourth time and the last time that John calls Gaius beloved. We saw it in verse 1, verse 2, verse 5, and now for the fourth time. This is a loving man. No wonder why he was dubbed the apostle of love. And then he gives the command here, do not imitate what is evil. We have a contrast that's about to take place because we've been learning about Diotrephes, who is a wicked individual. And then in the next verse, we're going to learn about Demetrius, who was a godly individual. So don't imitate what is evil. See here, but what is good. In other words, don't imitate Diotrephes, but I want you rather to imitate men like Gaius and then Demetrius, who we will see in the next verse. Well, let's do a little tour here because the word for imitate appears seven times from the Greek New Testament, and the first five of the seven uses are given by the Apostle. Paul. So let's just take a little tour. Uh, to begin with, go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. 1 Corinthians chapter 4. You see here that in the book of uh, 1 Corinthians, Paul had founded a church. Approximately five years later, he's writing to this congregation, and he had expected them to be mature after five years, but they were not. He addresses them as carnal or fleshly. And now over here in chapter 4, look at verses 16 and 17. Therefore, I urge you, and here's her term, imitate me. Now we got an example of imitation that the Corinthians should have picked up upon. Verse 17. For this reason... I have sent Timothy to you, who is my beloved and faithful son in the Lord, who will remind you of my ways in Christ as I teach everywhere in every church. I love this. Paul had his son in the faith, Timothy. And Timothy was discipled by Paul. So as Timothy was dispatched to the church of Corinth, he would remind the members of that church of Paul's ways. That's imitation as imitation should be done. And then if you would just spring forward just a bit, I mentioned it earlier, but 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And now we're in verse 1. For the second time, Paul says, imitate me. But this time he adds, just as I also imitate Christ. To imitate Christ is to imitate what is good. To imitate Paul is to imitate what is good. To imitate Gaius is to imitate what is good. And then we'll see with Demetrius as well. Uh, Ephesians chapter 5, that's our next uh, reference there. Uh, go past 2 Corinthians and Galatians, over to the book of Ephesians and in chapter 5. Picking it up in verse 1. 
Therefore, be imitators. There's our term again. Imitators of God as dear children. And then not only are we to imitate God, but what else are we to do? We are to walk in love. And see, then the example is Christ. And then one last reference. First Thessalonians. So just keep moving over to your right. Going past Philippians and Colossians. Right over the first Thessalonians. And I always marvel at the church of Thessalonica because they were a model church. They were simply a pattern for other churches to see and to imitate their goodness. And over here in chapter 1, down in verse 6, Paul writes, And you became followers, see those who mimic us uh, and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction, with joy of the Holy Spirit. Well, wasn't that Paul and Silas and Timothy? Do you remember uh, what Paul had experienced? He got put out of Thessalonica because he was preaching the gospel. And the Thessalonian saints are also persecuted. See, but you became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction. And it almost looks like a contradiction, but it says with joy of the Holy Spirit. In the same way that Paul could sing in prison with Silas in Acts chapter 16, these believers were imitating what was good, Paul and Silas, and now they were exhibiting the same characteristics. So we need to imitate what is good, and we do that often by learning about good people and imitating them. Come back with me, please, over to uh, 3 John. And then down in verse 11... John writes, he who does good is of God. The way you can tell someone is truly born again is that there is goodness that springs from that person's life, but by way of contrast. But he who does evil has not seen God. We will now transition from our third point to our fourth point. Maintain a multifaceted witness for Jesus. I love this. Maintain a multifaceted witness for Jesus. Now down in verse 12, I've sort of introduced them, but we meet him for the first time here in the book. Demetrius has a good testimony from all. He again is contrasted with diatrophies. And I want you to observe he has a good testimony. And the word testimony here is a perfect tense verb. He's had a good testimony in the past, but that testimony continues to the present. That's what should be able to be said of all of us that we've got a great testimony. And I talked about multi faceted witnesses. Now I want to tell you who the first witness is and we see this in verse 12. First witness, witness number one is from all. Hmm. That's rather interesting. Speaks of the extensiveness of his goodness. Everyone who came in contact with Demetrius expressed his goodness, expressed the kind of saint that he is. Can you really imagine that? Everybody who met him only had good things to say about him. It makes me think about Paul's associate, his protege, Timothy. In uh, Acts chapter 16, uh, there it says that he was well spoken of by the brethren who were at Lystra and I. Conium. Both those regions, people who knew Timothy, spoke well of him. Do you have a good testimony from all? Second witness from the truth itself. John personifies the truth. In other words, he brings it to life and lets the truth be the second witness here. And now we transition to the third witness. And we also bear witness. John, if you will, took out his apostolic stamp of approval and put it upon Demetrius. He is noting 
what he has seen in Demetrius's life is worth praising because this man has a great witness. All people know it. The truth comes alive and testifies to it. But now also we have John signify that this is a man of God and he is bearing witness. And John adds, and you know our testimony is true. I bet that couldn't have been said about Diotrephes. I bet you couldn't trust his witness, but you could trust the witness of the apostle here. I want you to stop, I want you to consider what everyone would say about you, particularly the Christians that know you, but even those who don't know the Lord, would they testify that you exhibit goodness that you are a person who is reflecting the character of God and they would only have wonderful things to say about you. And now, let's go to our fifth and our final point. Meet the brethren with the peace of Jesus. Meet the brethren with the peace of Jesus. Uh, look at verses 13 and 14 here. John says, I had many things to write. I'm sure he could have just kept on addressing certain things, both pro and con about this congregation. But I do not wish to write to you with pen and ink, but I hope to see you shortly. And we shall speak, and I love this, mouth to mouth, face to face. In the same way in Numbers chapter 12, when God is defending the character of Moses, he asks his sister Miriam, and brother Aaron, why were you not afraid to speak evil against my servant Moses? And God went on to say, I address him face to face. This is the kind of communication that John wants with the saints. He wants to do so face to face, and then he says, peace to you. You got to Bring in the Hebrew mindset here of shalom. It's speaking of peace with the prosperity of the individual both spiritually and physically. It's a wholeness of peace. This is what John desires for the entire congregation that they would know peace. Peace is a byproduct of being born again. Uh, Paul said in uh, Romans 5, 1, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, in Ephesians chapter 2, uh, Paul talks about preaching peace to those at Ephesus. And uh, you'll recall from Galatians chapter 5, the third fruit of the Spirit. Something that is to be produced in our lives as we walk with God, love, love, joy, and peace. And this is no small thing. Paul is wishing that the congregation would truly know peace. And I'd like to just expand upon this for a moment. Come over with me, please, to the book of Revelation. Book of Revelation, chapter 1. And as you're turning over to the book of uh, Revelation, we have a uh, greeting that takes place in this book. Ultimately, in chapter 1, we get introduced to Jesus the judge. And that judge is going to enact judgment with the seven churches because he walks in the midst of the churches and in the tribulation period in chapters 6 through 19. Then at the great white throne judgment in Revelation chapter 20, he is a judge. And if you recall back from John chapter 5 and verse 22, it says the father judges no one but has committed all judgment. To whom? To the son. Here in Revelation chapter 1, John has been banished to the isle of Patmos for preaching the gospel. Uh, tradition says it was the mission uh, the Roman emperor who had given him hard time for what he had done in representing Christ. So here in 1-4, John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace to you and observe here and peace from him. This is a reference to God. From him who is and who was and who is to come. The idea is that God is eternal. 
So if he's eternal, there is no lack of peace within his very presence. He's a God of peace. There is no peace to the wicked, says Isaiah, but when you know God, and I mean when you really know God, he floods you with his peace, and he has no lack of peace that he can give to you. Why? He is eternally God. Then he goes on to say, and from the seven spirits. I believe the seven spirits here is a reference to the Holy Spirit, seven being a number of completion. And it wouldn't make sense. Uh, some people believe that it's a reference to angels. But would you put angels on the same level as the greeting and the peace from God? And then later we're going to see from Christ. I don't think so. So the seven spirits, so there's the peace from them as well, who are before his throne. See, awaiting for God to dispatch them. To do his will. And observe in verse 5. And from Jesus Christ. From Jesus Christ. He's called the faithful witness. What do we have in Revelation 1? There is a greeting. To the seven churches. From the Holy Trinity. From the Father. From the Spirit. And here also from the Son. So back in 3 John. When John says peace to you, don't take that lightly. God and Trinity can flood your soul with a peace that surpasses understanding. And that's exactly what the Apostle Paul speaks about in Philippians chapter 4. Peace to you. Our friends greet you, greet the friends by what? By name. You've got to have the right friends. There are two kinds of socialization. There's the negative socialization. Evil company corrupts good morals, 1 Corinthians 15. Proverbs 13 and verse 20 says, He who walks with wise men will be wise, but a companion of fools will be destroyed. It's interesting that as you start to bring this to a close, John extends peace to the saints and he would bring greetings but by the friends by name. So important that we have Christian friends who model Christ for us so we can see their goodness and be challenged by it. Let me run through these five points and then I want you to turn with me to Hebrews chapter 13. Uh, number one, Yield to the direction of church leaders. If you want to find blessing in your life, you get under authority. You figure out governmentally in any nation, what are the laws of the land and you honor them. In the structure of the church of Jesus Christ, you find a good church that stands upon solid doctrine built on the foundation of Christ that has a pastor or multiple pastors, and you take yourself, and it's the Greek term hupotasso, you arrange yourself under those leaders. You yield to the direction of church leaders, and God will bless your life because you're under the authorities where you should be. Remember, we saw that in 1 Peter 5. Number two, we need to confront those who don't yield to church leaders. When you have a rebel in your midst, and he will not get under the authority of another. For instance, in our case, we had diatrophies, not getting under John's authority. What do we do? We confront those who don't yield to church leaders. They're in a dangerous place, and they're giving dangerous counsel. Number three, we mimic the good and display your relationship with God. As we are imitators of God and those who serve God, we display our goodness within that God gives us. And it tells people that our God is alive. Number four, we maintain a multifaceted witness for Jesus. Many people should be able to say about us that we regularly showcase the goodness of God. And then finally, we meet the brethren with the peace of of Jesus. And now I trust you're over with me in Hebrews chapter 13. Let's look at two verses to close. Verse 7 and then 17. Verse 7. 
The command here is remember, keep on remembering those who rule over you who have spoken. Now, I just want to draw your attention uh, to that expression, who have spoken. It's a past tense verb. What the writer most likely is doing here is talking about those leaders who are probably now in the presence of the Lord that exhibited to the congregation the teachings and the ways of God. So you remember those who rule over you who have spoken the word of God to you. You need to remember them and arrange yourselves under the counsel that they had given to you. But now they're off the scene. But down to verse 17, still in chapter 13. Obey those who rule over you and be submissive. Two critical commands here. Obey those who rule over you. And number two, be submissive. Why is it that you should submit to the leaders in the church? For they watch out for your souls. It's that simple. They have been entrusted by the great shepherd as under shepherds with your soul care. For they watch out for your souls as those who must give an account. And notice what he says here. Let them do so with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable for you. It is a joy for pastors to have submissive congregational members in the church of God. And if you're not, and you wreak havoc upon the pastor's lives, it's not going to go well for you in the long run. So I want to encourage you to get yourselves under your God-given authorities, because that's the place of protection, but also God's blessing. Take a moment, employ, apply what you've learned here today and tell God that you are going to be obedient to the five things that you learned today. Let's pray. Thank you, Heavenly Father. As I look back at being at the same local church for 40 years, there's one thing I just really want to express my gratitude to you concerning. Thank you, Father, that I learned the concept of being under the leadership early on and have aspired to practice that. Now as a church leader and pastor, it's a joy to know that I was under authority and by your grace, now I'm in authority. I would pray for all those that have heard this profound message from the Apostle John today, that they would enact all five employment points, that they would take themselves and yield, obey those who are in leadership above them, to be in a place of receiving your peace and your blessing and also then to be displayers of your goodness. Thank you for what you've accomplished in hearts today. In Jesus' name, amen.